I've actually been looking for an opportunity for the past almost two years since I first met Erica to collaborate on a project together. So uh, really thr thrilled that, that you and your students are here this evening. Thanks. Patrice Bone is a dear friend and colleague and beloved professor in our undergrad psychology and addiction studies concentrations. Welcome, Patrice. And Vincent Holmes is co-founder of Better Brothers Los Angeles, a local organization that we're very excited to have on board with us this evening. Uh, this is a quote from their website. Better Brothers LA is an organization that educates, inspires, and connects the black LGBTQ community in Southern California. Our mission is to develop a stronger sense of community and overcome the challenges of cultural and religious opposition to our orientation. Um, so I'm going to start by handing that to you, and you guys can share that. Well, since I have the mic, I'll, I'll speak. Um, um, I was actually just saying to Erica, watching it for the second time, that I've closer. I've re-fallen in love with the movie. I, when I first saw the trailer, I was like, I have got to see this movie. I could not wait. I was there opening weekend, loved it the first time. Now watching it a second time, I just love it again. And, the, and one of the things that I appreciate the most about this film, besides the story, is just how visually beautiful it is. It's not very often that you get to see such beautiful images of black people. The way in which the camera holds the skin, the faces, the, fe the features. It's like, I love being a black person watching, watching this film. Um, it's just moving and powerful in that way. And again, I'm re-loving that um, on second viewing. Oh, ladies first. <laughs> um, what stands out in a personal way? Um, I agree with Patrice. Uh, the beauty of the people in the film um, is moving. Also, I think I did not see it on opening week. I did not see it um, in a pre-screening. I actually saw it um, probably last month for the first time uh, on demand. And I think that when I reflected on why, because I am a very... Um, I'm a movie enthusiast, so you know I really had to reflect on why. And I think that what I came up for myself, uh, the answer that I came up with for myself, was um, the the pain that I saw in the movie, and that is um, very overwhelming for me. And I um, had heard great things about the film. But because of the work that I do and uh, some of the things that are um, part of my personal life, um, along with the beauty, the pain for me is overwhelming because it touches so many people in my life in a very real way. And I didn't want to go see that on the big screen. I did not want to see that. I did not want to feel that. I did not want to relive that. Um, but I can appreciate the honesty. There. So this is actually my third time seeing the film, um, and since she's my sister, um, I guess we, we I guess we share some of that, um, some of the the personal challenges that we see reflected in the film. But what I most enjoy about the film, and what it reminds me of every time I see it, is the complexity of life and the complexity of identity and uh, the many paths that individuals have to navigate in order to feel a sense of wholeness and a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of uh, being. Um, and every time I see it, it reminds me of that. Um, his, he had so many struggles. His, 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 his sexual identity was like way down on the list, honestly, in terms of the things he had to deal with growing up. And in some ways, I think about that as well, is that of all the things I had to deal with growing up as a child, you know, who I was going to sleep with was really not necessarily omnipresent at all times in my life. So it, it reminded me of just that complexity of life, things that many people have to navigate, particularly people of color um, growing up you know, in the midst of the crack epidemic. I, it, there was just so much else to deal with and, 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 and how, 
how he had to slowly come into that sense of identity, come into that old sense of, of, of sexuality and what that meant for him. So it was, it was beautifully done, um, and it's, it's always a pleasure to see it. Well, one of, one of the things that, it definitely struck me the first time, but even more powerfully so on this viewing, is the constraints of masculinity. Um, one of the things that I've always understood as a woman, or as a girl, you know, very, very young I understood this, that one of the things that I was not required to do was know how to get, take a punch in the face and punch somebody else in the face. Like that was just not a requirement of me. Um, and for a boy like Chiron, who is introverted for reasons, not necessarily birth temperament, um, who is probably very sweet natured, sensitive, not really interested in fighting. One of the first things that we see in the movie is that he's running away. He's not walking into the fight. He's no ruffian. Like that's not that's not who this child is. But he has to in order to survive. He has to. Like he does not have a choice. And what really um, one of the most moving scenes to me is when uh, Juan tells Sharon you have to decide who you're going to be in this world. You can't let other people decide. But the fact of the matter is that there is there are so many other factors that are going to shape what choices and options are available to him. And you know, Zen, peace out, nonviolent boy in the corner, not gonna work. Absolutely not gonna work because the people around him are not gonna let him. And that's painful to watch. And it and and you can see how it plays out when he beats up the boy in high school, later on when he becomes a drug dealer himself and he's putting on this band costume, almost like a superhero costume, and uh, Kevin says, well, that's not you. And he's like, you don't know me, but the fact of the matter is it's not him, but he has to. And that's, that's a very powerful, powerful point that the, the movie makes. Um, and... Along the lines of, of that, I think that um, one thing that's very kind of prominent in the film is the absence of um, black male, um, black male positive figures in his life. Um, and so, and within the African American communities, there are a number of societal um, social, 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 historical, and political reasons for that, and so um, you see Chiron as he um, goes into adulthood, um, kind of take on the persona of the one male that we see who shows him kindness and nurturing. He takes that on. Uh, there's a psychologist um, who's at UC Irvine who does a lot of work around black male identity. Uh, not necessarily black gay male identity, but talking about black male identity. And one of the things that he says is very important is understanding reference group orientation. So who are the African American males using as a reference group? And what happens when that reference group is kind of unattainable? And he says that it is important for um, black male youth to ask themselves three things. And it's interesting because when I see Sharon in the film, I see those three things kind of coming to the forefront. And he says that um, in identity development for African-American males, they have to ask themselves, who am I? And define that question. So who am I? And oftentimes, there is a lot of incongruence because of the reference group orientation. So it's kind of who am I in, um, in um, relation to the reference group. And then he says, who am I? And then am I who I say I am? So there has to be congruence in how you identify yourself and then how you present yourself. And then he says, then the third question is, am I all that I ought to be? So I'm not everything that I can be or that's purposed in me to be. And I see Sharon kind of struggling with who am I without having 
any individual is really to kind of identify with. So finding a reference group. And then am I who I say I am, which is kind of what Kevin points out. Like, who are you, man? That's not even you. Um, and then who is he? Is he all that he ought to be? Now he's someone who talks about having a trap house, which is selling drugs or having a drug house, for those of you who don't know. I mean, you know, so he is this person who is the opposite of who he was. He tried to stay away from drugs, even tried to, in some ways, sever his relationship with Juan because he was selling drugs. And now this is who he is who he has become, so is he all that he ought to be. So when I think about this, the notion of identity development, it's really within the context and um, who these young individuals, these young males have as, as kind of models or role models in their lives to demonstrate the, you know, the variations of um, expressions of masculinity and sexuality mm -hmm. and success. Well, I was just going to mention that I, what what I found, I, don't, I guess it's oppressive, mm -hmm. but really more sad is that I didn't feel like he had a childhood. Mm -hmm. um, is that, you know, from his earliest point, um, he, it seems like he was really raising himself. Um, and, and and with very little direction, uh, role models, mentors, coaches, anything in his life to sort of help steer him in the right direction. Um, and that was a product of, you know, the, the, you know, historical reasons for that, political reasons for that, economic reasons for that. Um, you know, Liberty City, Miami, in the 1980s was probably a pretty bad place to be. And the, you know, how very sad it was to be this young person growing up in that environment with very little direction, um, a mother who was in and out of your life, um, physically, emotionally, um, and you know. You know, and there are, there are reasons why that is the case for too many young people of, of color in communities of color, and I think that that's certainly a form of oppression. It's really sad, but it's, it's definitely a form of oppression as well. Wow. <laughs> Take a breath. Yeah. You know, and you know, that's a it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult question. It is in many in many respects, you know, it undergirds part of the reason why we started Better Brothers LA and that so many black um, gay men, women, et cetera, have such a difficult time reconciling their sexuality with their religion, in most instances their Christianity. Um, and while it, I agree it wasn't addressed in the movie, you, you can't talk about the black experience in America without talking about religion. And you certainly can't talk about the black gay experience in America without talking about the difficulty of integrating those two things together. Um, you know, I think that there are, there are, there are some inclusive, you know, organizations out there, religious organizations out there that are helping to helping some people to navigate that. But it is definitely an area that I think requires great attention, great work. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I will say is that I actually work for one of the, I do clinical training, part-time for one of the largest African-American churches in Los Angeles. It's the church that bought the Great Western Forum when the Lakers left uh, and held church in the Forum. So a very large, um, vastly predominantly African-American church who um, I'm very, very happy to say is struggling with this issue in 2016. It wasn't even a question in 2010. Um, so the fact that conversations are now being ha had in many churches um, across the country around theology and sexuality and, um, and um, kind of questioning this, um, what's the way that I can put it, um, oppression of many members of the congregation. 
Um, and I started kind of doing work and researching and, and kind of understanding dynamics in the African American community. And within the community and the church as well, um, there is a very um, pervasive um, 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 pervasive kind of ideology and a behavior that is very akin to don't ask, don't tell, which has survived over many, many years, meaning that many members of the community and the congregation will have ideas and even um, know of others' sexuality within the church. But as long as those individuals don't come out or don't um, announce their sexuality, then they are considered part of the community. Once it is articulated, then individuals begin to shun or ostracize. And when I say, like, people are aware, so for example, there's two 40-year-old men who are roommates who both make $150,000 a year. It is fine. They can direct the choir. They can sing a solo every Sunday. They can come over to Christmas dinner as roommates. But as soon as they say partners, then there is a complete kind of psychological shift. But I am optimistic because there are conversations that are being had in church. How are, what are we going, are we going to be accepting and affirming? Are we going to be accepting and not affirming? And what does that mean? And, and do, can we go back and look theologically to say that this doesn't even make any sense? So, but it is a slow progression, but it is a sign of oppression. So religious oppression is very, um, uh, very real. I, I have a um, annotated bibliography uh, that Jamie, the trauma work study student, so uh, wonderfully put together. That's on the back, back table, and one of the art articles are around spirituality versus religion, and um, uh, and its relationship to depression and or substance abuse in African-American male um, gay men. And one of the things that the, the um, researchers found was that religion was more closely associated with depression and substance abuse, where spirituality was actually basically a protective factor. So the difference between being spiritual versus re religious. And I just want to talk a little bit about the kind of broader social and historical context if we think about where the where the movie began this is you know the height of the crack era something which the black church was trying to grapple with and not very well because of the effects of you know deindustrialization people just vast majorities of, of, of black men unemployed or being arrested and put in prison it's not shocking that don't ask don't tell was the policy without thought to the consequences and the effects of that kind of silencing and erasing of experience. And it's, it's ironic because the black church was also the locus of, uh, of the civil rights movement in decades before where it was like, see us, know us, hear us. Um, and it is heartening to know that we are evolving. Um, but this is a very, it's a very difficult conversation because quite often in in black communities, I'm going to use the word communities instead of communities, that we tend to say black community as if there is a single um, monolithic experience, but we're much more complicated than that. And uh, we're finally making space for that multiplicity and complexity. I think the film is... I think the film is aspirational, um, and, I, and I think you know. I think there has been um, greater interest. Um, I think this film, because of its mainstream nature, I think more people have probably seen it than have, you know that have seen other films that were African American gay focused. There have been others. This is not the first one, um, but I think um, it, it's you know given its mainstreamness. Um, there's a larger audience, people are seeing, I think there have been conversations in black communities um, in, in which this film has been discussed, um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I don't necessarily know if this is, this film is not a panacea, it's not going to like change, you know, I don't think everyone's position, um, I know what I expect any film to do that, but, but I think it has opened up the conversation to a larger audience, and I think that's a good thing. 
Um, I, I completely uh, agree with that, but I also want to, I, I would argue that this film is coming out of a broader conversation that's going on amongst black folks about we're interested in seeing lots of different stories about black experiences and not just the one thing. Um, you know, I'll date myself here, but you know, in the, in the 90s, you know, there was kind of a spate of really cool, really great black movies, but almost all of them were about um, gang life in the ghetto, like almost all of them. Um, uh, and I don't know if you guys know, Barry Jenkins <laughs> directed another film a few years ago, which was about um, young black people in San Francisco who were navigating mostly white spaces. Really, really interesting, tiny indie movie, and I can't remember the name of it right now, but check it out. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. Um, and if that's just not something that, you, that I would have seen 20, 25 years ago. Um, and so I think we're going to see, as things move forward, more variety of, of stories, and, and not just about the black experience, but black experiences. I think I'm going to take that one. Um, this is my third time seeing the film, and it wasn't until this viewing that I caught in the second section when Chiron's mom comes and eventually asks him for money and takes money. There's a quick exchange and a reference to the funeral when they're talking about Teresa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my assumption tonight was that Juan died somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Having having uh, having had a sister who went through the whole PhD stuff, um, <laughs> and and all and, and several friends who also have had doc doctoral degrees in, in psychology, while I think therapy is wonderful, and I, and I think you know the, the 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 space to have conversations with someone who is is somewhat neutral and independent and has sort of a. a um, a whole school of, of theory behind them and behind how they can sort of review and come up with you know stories to help you with your life, etc. I think that's important. I think that's great. I think you know the, it's important to also remember uh, the, the significance of community um, and and how um, healing and affirming occurs in all kinds of spaces, as my sister likes to tell me. And and I think this movie reminds us that. Um, you know, Sharon didn't go to a therapist. He didn't. He didn't go to um, a psychologist. Um, he he had an opportunity to connect with someone who touched his heart um, at a very important, critical point in his life. And he had he found an opportunity to re-engage with that individual. And that, at least, you know, being the optimist that I am, makes me believe that that had that that could be the the moment that moves his life forward. That, that, that gives him the, the space, um, the comfort, the affirmation that he needs to move forward, to make better decisions, uh, to understand his life, understand the context of his life, understand his purpose, and to move forward. And I think, hopefully, that's the goal of communities um, as well. And, and I would hope that, that as you are learning your, 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 um, you're learning your task um, and your, your, how you want to move as a psychologist, that you also remember that part of your goal, I believe, should be to allow people to transition back into a community with, with certain strengths so that as they navigate their lives in communities, that they are able to do that um, and to do that successfully. And so, you know, the goal is not to be in therapy for 50 years, I wouldn't think, but, but to, to, to build certain strengths so that as you go back into community, you're fine, you're, you're able to deal with your, your stressors. Um, and, and to sort of move forward with it. I would also say that, you know, one of the things that this film highlights very well from my perspective is intersectionality, as Vincent mentioned before, and that it's important for you to be curious and really do a thorough assessment to understand from the client's perspective uh, what their salient areas of distress or issues are if they come into therapy. That you can't assume that, oh, 
because you grew up gay in this community that's rejecting, then that's, that must be what's causing your distress. Not necessarily. For Sharon, it could have been that I had a crack addicted mother who was never there and I took care of myself so I'm having now attachment difficulties. Attaching to anyone, regardless of my sexuality or my sexuality is lower on the list, you know, with what I feel is presenting now. So it's very important for us as clinicians to remember that the client is the expert on their life. And for us not to assume because we have a little knowledge about how difficult this experience could be for someone that that is the experience that they're coming into therapy into therapy with and my brother uh, quotes me very well my mantra if you've ever had a cl class with me is always that we are not the sole agents of change and that the best thing that we can do for a client is to help them so that they can navigate the communities in which they are a part of without paying us our hourly fee. And so to believe that the only way that a person can achieve um, uh, psychological health is by sitting in our office, you're doing a client a disservice. One of the best things might be to say, oh, I know this organization that does these great social things, so maybe you, you know, maybe you can go there and go to a meeting and come back and talk to me about, you know, about it. But helping our clients to be connected to the outside world, not become dependent on us. So I think it's really important, important for uh, those of you who are majoring in psychology to think about doing a thorough assessment and finding out from the client's perspective um, how their their experiences have impacted them or are impacting what's presenting in your office. It exists. <laughs> I mean, it exists in the broader black communities. Um, it, it is an issue, but I mean, it's a, it is an artifact of white supremacy. And so, you know, I, and oh, so so color, colorism would 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 be prejudice according to um, skin tone, typically darker on the lower end of the totem pole, lighter skinned. On, on the higher end of the totem pole. And it, and it comes out in different ways depending upon the, the context, right? Um, but because, because we live in a white supremacist society, right? Um, because uh, we are the descendants of slavery, all of us, even the white people, you know, this, con this country is a byproduct of slavery. This is where the colorism comes from. And it will show up in lots of different ways in different communities, and the LGBT community is no, is no different. Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> and I'll also say this. It also comes in waves. So for example, looking at Mahersha Ali and uh, Sharon, chocolate is in. <laughs> right now, we're on a chocolate wave. <laughs> Especially the character of black. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, we got Idris Alba, like, so black is in right now. So we're all right, so there, there, no, honestly, there, there are waves. I remember growing up in the 70s, it was very prevalent. There was a group called DeBarge, like everyone was kind of biracial and very, you know, very light-skinned, um, but it comes in waves, and it is something that within the African-American community, we do grapple with and on different lever differing levels, again, depending on context. Um, if you had to name one thing that you most appreciate about this film, well, what would it be? <laughs> well, I appreciate the story, um, you know, you know, we started um, Better Brothers Los Angeles because there was a desert um, of social and networking opportunities for gay black men in Los Angeles. There was just nothing. Um, and we went on to develop this, this thing that we call the Truth Awards. It's an event we put on annually to, 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 to recognize the accomplishments of individuals in the black LGBTQ community. And 
we did it so that when we did it because we wanted to make ourselves visible, um, and it was important that we be seen. And so when I when this film came out, we it was very important to us that we did everything we could to publicize it to market because it was another opportunity for us to be seen. And I think um, as black gay men, sometimes we get sort of mixed in with the sort of larger mainstream gay community. And, you know, just like, um, you know, just like our, our identities um, are layered, so our, our sexuality is, it's all layered and, you know, our struggles are, are, are somewhat different than mainstream gay, gay individuals because we're black at the end of the day. And so when, you, when, when, when we're seen, we're seen as black, largely, before we're seen as gay. Um, but it was important that we be visible as black gay individuals. And so this film was, a, was another affirmation of, this, of the importance of us showing our stories, our specific stories, um, and, and they're different than others. Um, and showing the beauty, the complexity, the, 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 the challenges of, of growing up in America um, as black, as gay. Um, and so that film, this film, reminded us of that, and it was an opportunity for a larger community to see it as well. And so that's what I'm really happy about about this film. So uh, one of the things that I would say um, about the film, but I wanted to touch on this, with the Truth Awards, get one of the... Um, the um, Programs. Yeah, the programs that are on the back table and just kind of flip through. This year at the Truth Awards, they honored Tracy Norman, who is the first African-American transgender model. And one of the things that was touching about her story was that she, I think she's 60-some now, but she was modeling in the 70s and she was getting work and she said that, um, you know, she hid the fact that she was transgender um, because it was the 70s. And uh, she was doing Clairol, pictures on Clairol, which is black hair products. And she said one day she was um, outed at a photo shoot. And she saw some people in the corner whispering and talking about her. And then they asked her to leave. Uh, what was amazing and what she said was um, when she uh, responded to the um, invitation to the awards from Better Brothers, she said for her, it felt as if she had come full circle right. because the person who outed her in the 70s was an African-American gay man. So to be recognized uh, in 2017 by this organization of African-Americans acknowledging uh, her struggle and what she's done for the community uh, really, really, really touched her and she began to cry. Also last year she was invited back and is on a Clairol box. So Clairol recognized and brought her back. So how things have kind of transitioned over 35, 35 years and you know this kind of acknowledgement within the black community. So one of the things that I really um, appreciate about the film is that it shows a complexity of, um, it shows a com the complexities of intersectionality and identity and the confluence of those. And I also think it's a love story. So, you know, it's a love story and how we attach to those who are nurturing or compassionate or see a part of us and, and recognize that. I definitely want to piggyback on that last point. Um, there's so many things I love about this movie, but um, intimacy between black men is rarely de depicted on the big screen, let alone an Oscar-winning film. Yeah. Um, and, and and not just the sex part. You know, this wasn't about you know seduction and getting it on, but it was about tenderness. Um, you know, the the tenderness that Juan showed. Sharon as a little kid while he's teaching him to swim is so moving and touching. Um, the first time that uh, Kevin and Sharon hook up, it is so 
tender and this heartbreakingly sweet. Um, the you know the way in which he you know grabs the back of his head in this uh, firm but gentle kind of way. You never, you never, never see that on screen. Um, even in a, with a heterosexual couple, you hardly see black love in that in that kind of way. And it's just it's beautiful. And then of course that you know that final scene just oh. It just, it just gets to me. It's, it's so beautiful. A big thank you to the panel. <laughs> what a wonderful evening. Thank you. And just uh, uh, to let you know that uh, Antioch is making a donation to Better Brothers. Wow.